I'm Sue O'Connell. Tonight on Greater Boston, on the campaign trail and in the AG's office, Maura Healy managed to keep her private life to herself. But with her new job as governor comes a lot more scrutiny. Then, another case solved by DNA in genealogy databases. This time, the murder of four Idaho students. It's a boon for law enforcement, but is it good for the rest of us? We'll discuss. As we know, Maura Healy's inauguration made both state and U.S. history last week as the first woman elected governor of Massachusetts and one of two out lesbian governors elected nationwide in November. And Healy made history at her previous post, too, as the country's first out gay attorney general. But despite her longtime public profile, Healy has kept much of her personal life private. That is, until this week. Healy and her partner of two years, her former deputy at the AG's office, Joanna Lydgate, gave an interview to Boston Globe columnist Yvonne Abraham that came out Monday. In it, Healy explained her reasons for maintaining her privacy, saying, holding on to my personal relationships and close-knit circle probably helped me get through the last eight years. But now that she's in the corner office on Beacon Hill, how much of her private life does she owe the public? I'm joined now by Arlene Isaacson, co-chair, Massachusetts Gay and Lesbian Political Caucus, along with Democratic activist and writer Mary Breslauer. Welcome to both of you, Arlene. We'll just go to it. It's certainly a historic moment uh, for everyone, but especially celebrating it here in the home of marriage equality in Massachusetts. You're so right, Sue. I mean, we have how historic and how moving this whole thing has been to have an out and proud lesbian who's been, who is articulate and hardworking and caring and thoughtful and compassionate, who candidly I think is going to make a fabulous governor, but very importantly, who is supported overwhelmingly in her election and overwhelmingly by straight men and women. And that's incredible and historic and wonderful. So, well, Go ahead. I was going to say, Mary, I've spent a lot of time in the past week speaking to colleagues and, and other folks in the news business talking about the story that broke in the globe about uh, Moore Healy's relationship and trying to explain to them that it's not quite as salacious as they may think it is because the avenues to institutional relationships were not available. Uh, and also being who we are, you know, being a little, little baby lesbian, you didn't necessarily know you were a little baby lesbian until later. Um, can you just talk about for our audience what we didn't have the avenues to when we were born uh, prior to maybe 2003? Well, I mean, I think you just really have to go to our sort of young adulthood. I mean, it was 1990 and uh, WFNX had one in 10, you know, the first LGBT radio show in the country. And I have to tell you, Sue, and you know, you were so involved in the second half of that show. To this day, somebody stops me and says, are you Mary Breslauer? I can't tell you how important it was for me to have that radio outlet. There was no internet. Uh, libraries did not carry our books. And as you know, this was a show that was on from like 10 to midnight. So people could go home and put their transistor radio on if you were in high school and, and listen to people talking about LGBT lives that they had no indication was out there. You know, you look at the polling. In the mid 1990s, 68% uh, of the country was opposed to marriage equality. Today, 70% of the country is for marriage equality. You know, the AIDS epidemic, as tragic and horrific as that was, compelled many of us to come out. You know, many people who were in the closet came out. You go to Don't Ask, Don't Tell, that horrendous and disgrace policy that Clinton put into place. And you had the covers of Time Magazine and Newsweek with patriotic LGBT Americans serving their country. And it became very difficult to ignore us. So that I think was sort of the sort of modern age, 20th century sort of lead up to the marriage equality front. But you know, the numbers have flipped in the last 25 years and uh, it has a lot to do with, you know, why we have more Healy as our as our governor today. And Arlene, yep. to, to Mary's point, though, the other side of this is we're now at a, a point where we've got the don't say gay 
business happening in Florida, challenges for uh, trans individuals in the United States. You know, I'm reading story after story of people, trans folks saying, I'm considering leaving the United States because I don't feel safe here. From another front, we've had an attempt on a sitting governor uh, kidnapping the governor of Michigan, uh, and we've got a, a, a very divisive and violent uh, fraction, faction of, of Americans. Um, and I've been saying I, I, I can understand why almost any elected official would want to keep their private life private. And talking about the ways that, you know, maybe it's time for us to have a governor's mansion here in Massachusetts as well. I mean, you know, I, Charlie Baker and his family haven't gone through a number of protests on their mm -hmm. front lawn, which I'm not sure really moved the ball forward on any of the issues that folks were protesting. Well, you're right. We're in a very difficult time right now. But if you recall, it wasn't just over the last several decades. There have been so many vile, ugly, false things said about us 30, 40, even 20 years ago. Um, accusations and condemnations that were that that were that were nowhere near um, anything having to do with the reality of our lives. We made it through those for the most part, certainly in Massachusetts enough to have gotten to a point, as Mary rightly points out, where an out lesbian can be elected governor. And that's enormous. It's absolutely huge. Yes, the pendulum swings and it's swung back against us in the ways you just described. But sitting there watching the inauguration last week was so meaningful and so moving that I, I became teary watching it. Uh, and I'm a pretty hardened <laughs> old battle axe. Yeah, I didn't think anything like that could get to me anymore. But it was really moving. We were watching history being made. It was profound and it was important. And yes, things are bad in lots of places in the country. And we have Nazis here going after our community that we're going to have to fight against. But we've made it a long way. Mary, you write about uh, the inauguration in the in the Vineyard Gazette, and and both of you have worked in politics here in Massachusetts for decades. Um, and I know, Mary, that you were working in a world where you were probably one of the only lesbians and likely one of the few women uh, in in the offices of the halls of power. And to and and until recently, Massachusetts didn't have a really great scorecard when it came to statewide leadership for women. And it seems we've really just kind of leapfrogged ahead here. But talk about what the inauguration meant to you and what you saw and and the feelings that it brought up since we're talking since Arlene's opened the door about talking about feelings let's talk about feelings Mary how did you feel uh, yeah well, why, why why not why not look uh, you know what I wrote about was the inaugural party and to see the floor of the Boston Garden that parquet floor with the 17 championship banners hanging from the sky filled with women and girls and LGBT people waving, you know, rainbow light sticks and Brandy Carlisle being the, the lead entertainment, you know, Brandy and her wife who came to Massachusetts in 2012 to marry here. Um, I mean, to me, it just so encapsulated so much of what the three of us have lived through uh, with the battle scars to show it, right? Um, and, you know, yes, uh, uh, you know, a, a sea change. I mean, you know, Arlene remembers it was one of the ugliest moments in state government, bar none, the Babbitts and Jean foster care case, mm -hmm. where Dukakis took two boys away from two loving gay fathers, who, by the way, later adopted four boys who are now adults. Um, you know, clearly it had nothing to do but about the caliber of their parenthood. Um, and everybody went back in the closet back then. And uh, I happened to be in state government. I decided not to resign because I realized if I resigned, there was nobody who was going to be out in state government. Now think about that. That was 19, I'm taking a guess here, 84, 85, 86, mid 80s. Right. Yeah. And, you know, look at where we are today. So yes, a very different time. Just the civil rights bill, how difficult that was to get through our lane. The AIDS policies, all of it was a battle. Um, so yes, look, we live in a country where, and particularly now, where are these huge divisions, but I sort of feel there's more, there's more light there. There's just more light there. And there's more support there than uh, I think the far right magnet extremists would have you believe. And I think we saw that as Arlene pointed out, we saw that in the overwhelming numbers 
uh, for for more Healy. And I would add for Andrea Campbell, mm-hmm. who will be our first black attorney general. So, you know, honestly, Massachusetts has always been a great <laughs> place to be. And you feel it sort of even more profoundly after what's transpired in the last week, at least for me, at least for me. You know, Arlene, I, I often joke that we'll know whatever constituency we're talking about, we'll know we'll have equity when we can just be mediocre, right? Like we can be mediocre like everyone else. We don't have to be exceptional. And I remember I was hosting one in 10 one night in a, a year, you know, and uh, whenever it was decades ago, and a teenager called in and said something like, you know, someday we'll get to a point where being gay won't be the most interesting part of you. And I was struck by this week or this, this period where we've got but, you know, Governor Healy, and we've got other openly govern, uh, openly gay governors and openly elected officials. And then we've got George Santos, uh, the congressman from New York, who we think is openly gay. We don't know. He could maybe he's not. Who knows? You know, we don't even know if that is, na- is his name. But I, I've been struck by the coverage of him that whether him being gay is, again, the least interesting part of the story and actually doesn't really even fall into the coverage of it. So there is a moment to take and say, well, that's progress, too. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, firstly, if George Santos is gay, we're going to re- we're going to um, reject his certification and take it back. Um, take the card that. back, Arlene. Take the card back. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you're right. It's It's less of a big deal than it once was, though in the historic context, it's really a big freaking deal. And the fact of the matter is that for for Maura, when I saw that headline, that story, I was simultaneously thrilled for her. Although, as a friend said, the woman is so hot that probably it broke the hearts of a lot of lesbians (laughs) in the state. Um, But I was thrilled for her because you do, in a very intense political environment, you do need a safe haven, a place where... You, are, you can love and be loved and be protected in family. And so I was thrilled for her. And candidly, what a fabulous couple, two smart, bright, attractive women who have dedicated so much of their professional lives to public service. That's a, a great duo, in my opinion. All right, Arlene Isaacson and Mary Breslauer, thank you for all that you do, and great to see you. Hopefully, we'll see you in person sometime soon. Thanks for joining us on Greater Boston. Thanks. Hope so. Next up, you've likely heard of the gruesome murders at the University of Idaho where four students were stabbed to death while they were sleeping in their off-campus house in November. They were Ethan Chapin, Zana Karanodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves, all either 20 or 21 years old. You may have also heard that 28-year-old Brian Koberger, a Ph.D. criminology student at a nearby university, was arrested for the slayings late last month and charged with four counts of first-degree murder last week. But you may not know how investigators zeroed in on Koberger. Police cited a car registered to the suspect, which was caught on surveillance tape near the scene of the crime, and there were plenty of details about the crime scene. But according to a report from Slate, the main tools that led police to Koberger was something that it was never mentioned in the 18-page affidavit, forensic genealogy. I'm joined by the author of that report, tech writer Heather Tal Murphy and Antonio Regalado, senior editor for Biomedicine, MIT Technology Review. Welcome to both of you. Heather, I gave a little bit of a recap, but before we get to the, the DNA and the genealogy, can you just explain how the police zeroed in on this suspect? Because there were a lot of reports for a while, a lot of armchair folks saying police aren't doing anything, but apparently they were investigating. Yes. So on November 13th was this tragic day um, around 4 a.m. Somebody, a man wearing a mask covering most of his face, had entered this house where these students at the University of Idaho lived. And by the time the police arrived, they found four of them dead, um, two who were dating, two who were best friends. And he, on his way out, he walked by this very stunned roommate and left, seemingly left. And so one of the first things that everyone started hearing about in this case, partly because the Moscow Police Department put out lots of pleas on their Facebook page, was to please give them any tips about a white Hyundai Elantra. And so very quickly, they had found some surveillance footage which showed um, a white Hyundai Elantra. They weren't exactly sure. They didn't couldn't see the license plate. They weren't certain of the year. They had kind of a range of years from around 2011 to 2016 that they wanted this white Hyundai Elantra. But something we have to all keep in mind is that 
White Honda Elantras are actually some of the top selling cars in America. White is also one of the most popular colors for a car. So pretty quickly, they acknowledged on their Facebook page that they had thousands and thousands and thousands of white Honda Elantras. And so what we learned when, when this affidavit was released last week, this kind of peculiar fact that, um, you know, two weeks in, they certainly didn't have to seem to have a suspect. They certainly didn't seem to be advancing. And yet, very quickly, we learned from the affidavit in two different ways, they'd actually identified the the particular white Elantra that would come into play later, which is two different ways. One was through just searching white Honda Elantras that were registered to the nearby University of Washington they pulled out Brian Koberger's Elantra. Two, by sending out um, police officers looking for white Honda Elantras, a police officer actually stood in front of his apartment building in front of his white Elantra and wrote it down. But it would be a long time before they'd end up with a suspect. So the question there is why? What happened in that period between when they actually, through Brian Koberger, ended up on their list of white Elantras and suddenly he was the first you're breaking up on us just for a little bit there, so I'm going to jump to Antonio. Antonio, one of the so I'm having to keep the, the challenges okay. here in this um, this case is that you know we have also kind of voluntarily spit into vials and sent our DNA off to these genealogy um, uh, banks. And now police are able to access them to look for connections between DNA that they have. Um, was this anything that people thought about in advance of these genealogy websites? Well, it's important to uh, know why the genealogy websites arose in the first place. The, the first time uh, they were used to catch a killer was in 2018, and it was the Golden State Killer. But even before then, genetic genealogists had perfected this technique of going from someone's DNA to their relatives because um, they were working with uh, the children children who uh, uh, people had been uh, had been born from sper sperm donors or. Um, Adopted adoptees, a lot of adoptees. Yeah. Adoptees. Sorry, my someone just arrived <laughs> here. I uh, lost my train of thought. Right. Uh, donor conceived individual, individuals, adoptees, and even foundlings, like the proverbial, you know, child left uh, on the steps of the hospital. So uh, those people had wanted to find out who their birth parents were. Um, and this whole system of genetic genealogy was really uh, being used to help them. And Interestingly, there, there, there was a privacy issue too, because you know, maybe the parents didn't want to be found out, um, but for the, this community of genetic genealogists, the rights of these children to know who their parents were trump the privacy right of their parents. And, and Heather, my understanding is that most of these geneal genealogy databases were sort of somewhat open source, where you, the rules relax, things could happen, things couldn't. But those rules sort of have changed, but they're also changing still. But I'm wondering what was different about the way police use this database and these rules in investigating this, 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 this crime. That's an excellent question. So the 2018 Golden State Killer case that got a lot of attention was really the high, first really high profile murder case that this was used for. And shortly after that, police departments across the entire country started using this. They started working with genetic genealogists. But most of those cases were really old cases. The cases that they first started working with were cases that had gone cold many decades ago in most cases. And though there's been a handful of cases in which it's been used towards um, a more recent case or in an active investigation, what's different about this case is primarily that forensic genealogy or genetic genealogy came in so soon after the crime actually occurred, just a few weeks after. Whereas what we've mostly seen is that it's been used decades after. And it's not the only time that it's been used on an active investigation, but it's definitely the most high profile murder investigation that it's been applied towards so soon after. And just, I do want to clarify one thing because we were, we're talking about which databases can be used. It's good for people to remember this isn't with 23andMe and Ancestry.com. It is with GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA generally, um, which both have policies that do have people opt in or default opt in that they will permit their DNA uh, 
profiles to be used in this way. And and to that point, thank you for clarifying that, Heather. But and, Antonio, to that point, I think when people signed up to do this, as you said, they were searching for biological family members for one reason or another. I don't think any of them ever really expected to get a phone call from the police asking if they knew a, a, a second or third cousin that they are, are matching via DNA who may have been driving a certain car in a certain state. Um, how are these companies and how are users reacting to the concerns that, you know, we all want to help solve crime, but not all of us want to be, you know, pulled into a crime investigation? Right, right. Well, you know, I don't think the police are calling uh, the people in the database. They use, they use a match, as Heather recounts in her story, they use a match that can find a third cousin or who they think is a th third cousin or a second cousin. And then they go to other resources, birth and death records, and they build a huge family tree. And then they go into that family tree and they find uh, the people who are likely to be, you know, possibly the suspects. Um, certainly around the time of the original case, the Golden State Killer case, there was a big debate because the police had used this database without informing all the people who had contributed their DNA, right? It was a surprise. Um, there was a big debate and they sorted it, they sorted it out. Now you can choose to have your uh, DNA open so the police can search it and they recommend that, or you can choose to opt out. And there's also a limitation in this particular database, GD match or GED match, um, which is that it's only to be used for violent crimes, not, you know, breaking and entering. Um, but the fact is, you know, in 2023, whether it is facial recognition or DNA, you know, the ability to re remain anonymous in society is kind of going away. And, and Heather, it, 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 it is definitely that the horse is already out of the barn on many of these levels. But the other thing that concerns me, uh, or I guess maybe it might even be the main thing that concerns me, is the level of training that police departments are getting when uh, using face recognition software, when using uh, DNA forensic profiling, and of course, obviously, the bias that is already, we know, exists in definitely the facial recognition. What, what do you know, if anything, about law enforcement and what kind of training they're demanding in order to use this? Or was this just an anomaly that someone, someone figured out how to do this in this case and, and ran with it? So um, in this particular case, what happened is because it was a high, very high profile case, they ended up bringing in the FBI's forensic genealogy team. And they have about 100 people now focused on forensic genealogy. But you ask an excellent question, and there's a lot of discussion about this right now because a lot of in these lower profile cases, whether they're old cases or increasingly more recent cases, um, sometimes the, the agencies, the police departments are training up people on forensic genealogy themselves. Sometimes they're working with with people who are professional forensic uh, genetic genealogists. Some of those people have a long history. Some of those people maybe don't really know what they're doing. Now, um, so that there is a movement right now to try to figure out a, a certification process or some level of standardization, because overall this is not regulated and um, in any particularly clear way. And so that is a good question. I think some people say ultimately, you know, you're not supposed to make an arrest um, just based on what they call this genetic genealogy lead. You're supposed to wait till you've focused in on who it can be, and then they've gathered the DNA of that person and see if it confirms their hypothesis. But as we saw early on with some of these cases, things did go off the rails, where they began to focus in on the wrong person, um, where they began to use relatives of those people in the genealogy databases in ways that are were really wrong. Um, and so for that reason, there are concerns, and this connects back to the case we're talking about now, why there is so much discussion about what is in those court documents. So in the affidavit, it does not mention forensic genealogy, does not mention genetic genealogy. One of the reasons that people do want that mentioned somewhere, whether it's in that document document or in a different capacity is if we have no idea when it's used, it's very difficult for anyone to ask these questions. If we just, if it just happens behind the scenes, then who's going to be asking these questions? And so that is really one of the primary reasons that there is concern and discussion right now about the location in the documents. Antonio, it seems like every week I, I just feel like um, the s technology has advanced like a hundred years and lawmakers and society are 
kind of stuck and not catching up with it. Um, I, I, whenever I have an opportunity to talk to college classes and, and I tell them that there are things they should be concerned about right now because when they visit a college class when they're 60 and people ask, why didn't you do more about climate change? They may be asked, why didn't you do more about robot police dogs? You know, I mean, it's like things are happening right now. What should we at home be paying attention to in order to both, you know, again, we want to solve crimes, but protect privacy to protect society so that we don't move so fast without the proper guardrails. Right. Well, listen, it's, you know, to be able to, if, if in fact the technology was used to catch the, the guilty party in this terrible uh, set of murders, there's really not that much to complain about or even that much to worry about. It is good. It is good use of technology. Uh, I did assemble a list of things that DNA could be used for in the future, because I think that's what you're getting at you know, are we gonna be surprised with what DNA can do next? And from the scientific community, they believe that DNA is gonna be able to predict pretty accurately what you look like. So from a DNA sample, they could get something that looks like a picture of you. Um, Heather already mentioned how fast it is, it's real time. How fast can you go from DNA that you find, um, you know, on a table or on a knife uh, to the suspect? Um, and of course, you know, people are also, uh, the, police and investigators are able to work with like smaller and smaller amounts of DNA. So you can even imagine a situation where maybe you're at a political meeting um, and the police come afterwards and they swab the room and they can figure out everybody who was at this meeting, right? So um, that is why, you know, although I don't see, I don't personally see a critical privacy issue with finding killers. I also haven't submitted my <laughs> DNA to 23andMe or, or Ancestry.com because I don't know what's going to come next. All right. I appreciate both of you. Heather Tell Murphy, we direct folks to your article at Slate. Antonio Regalado, thank you so much for joining me and keeping us enlightened on this important topic. Thank you so much you. for having me. Bye. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow for Talking Politics. Some Boston city councilors want to bring police back to the public schools, but would that cause more problems than it solves? Plus, Maura Healy has her first sit-down as governor with the Senate president and the House speaker. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Good night.